Okay, okay, we'll have to do it some other way. Okay. We have power? We're on? Okay, Matos Masi. So that's those things that we have over here by the, the nether. Now, let's talk about this nether for a moment. A person makes a nether. Okay, so if you're over 13, the nether is binding. You're stuck. Unless, of course, you made a mistake. You made a nether by error, then you go to a rov and you're mater nether. What happens if a, a single girl makes a nether? Father, is it father 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 made the So the answer is, the father, when he hears the nether, he can either say, I allow it, then it's binding. Or he could say, no, I cancel the nether. Question. He has to hear the nether from her? Nope. He has to just hear that she made the nether. Whenever the day he hears that she made such a nether. Okay? So if she made the nether a week a later, he can cancel it. And somebody mother else. has the power too? Like no, father. it seems to be the father. I mean, somebody else could say, say I heard The mother can tell the father, and then the father can cancel. Okay. If the woman is married and but makes husband, a nether, husband. the husband can cancel it. Right? The husband can cancel it. Or the husband can say, no problem. If that's what she wants, that's her right, that's her business. Okay? So when it comes to Nidharam, there are rules. Certain Nidharam are automatically take effect, certain Nidharam don't. Rabbi Akiva was very disturbed by this because it says in the Pasuk that if a woman made a nether, and her father heard the nether, or her husband heard the nether, and he canceled out the nether, then it says, Hashem yislach lo. Hashem should forgive her. So Rashi says, why does Hashem have to forgive her? She said, I'm not going to eat meat. The husband <coughs> heard this. He canceled the nether. So what does Hashem have to forgive her? So Rashi says, we're talking about a case where the woman didn't know the husband canceled it. And she forgot and she ate meat. So even though, did she do something wrong? No, she didn't do something wrong. Right? It's like a person thinks it's, it's on Monday, today it's Monday, he thinks it's Shabbos. So he doesn't do anything, and all of a sudden he turns on the light by mistake. So now he feels terrible, I turned on the light by mistake. Goes to the rabbi, the rabbi says, what's your problem? Today is Monday. <laughs> did he violate Shabbos? No. So Rabbi Akiva cried. Why did he cry? Rabbi Akiva said, look, imagine a person thinks he's going to eat a piece of treif meat, pork, and he eats the meat, and he finds out later it's glot kosher meat. Did he do an Aveira? No. He still needs forgiveness. Why? Because it's not just what he did, but what was he thinking? He thought he was eating trafe. He wanted to eat trafe. He wanted to eat a cheeseburger with cheese and, and hamburger, but the cheese was parv. He didn't know it was parv. So he thought he was doing something terrible, and in the end, he dodged a bullet. Hashem has to forgive him. Hamburger, too, huh? <laughs> Right? During the nine days, he must have been... Uh, we don't know what. <coughs> Maybe it was fish. But so Rabbi Akiva says, imagine a person who wants to do an Aveira, doesn't do the Aveira, Hashem has to forgive him. Imagine if he does the Aveira. Imagine if the husband said the nether should stay and she does it. Look how bad the sin is. So Rabbi Akiva was very upset that a person could be guilty by the thought. Because normally, when it comes to sins, do we punish you for your thoughts? No. Only for your actions. Mitzvahs, we give you reward for your thoughts. Uh, there was one of the Pirushim I saw had a very different approach to it. Very, very different. Let's say, for example, a person says, a, a, let's say a Nazir. A Nazir says, I'm going to be a Nazir for 30 days. He's a Nazir for 20 days doesn't drink wine, doesn't take haircuts, nothing. And on day 20, he becomes Tamei. By accident. He's in shul, and someone has a heart attack, God forbid, and dies, and he now became Tamei. So what's the halacha? He has to become Tahar. 
and he has to count his Nazeros all over again. His 30 days Nazeros. But he has to bring a Korban. What's the Korban? The sin of Korban. What was his sin? Now remember, he was a Nazar, 20 days, he was in Shul, someone that had a heart attack and died. He, he didn't do anything wrong. He became Tommy. He has to bring a sin offering. What was his sin? The answer is, for 20 days, he did not drink wine. Did it count for anything those 20 days in the end? No, he had to start over. So for 20 days, you did something that didn't count. Hashem has to forgive you. Friday night, you didn't make Kiddush on wine. Why not? I'm a Nazir. But it came out that those 20 days were wasted because he became Tommy. So one of the Mephoshim say, look at it this way. A woman says, I take a nether, I'm not going to drink wine for two months. And she keeps all too much. She never violates the nether. Problem is, way back on day two, when her husband heard about it, he says, I canceled the nether, but never told her. So for two months, she kept the nether. Did she have to keep the nether? No. For two months, she didn't drink wine. She didn't make Kiddush on Friday night or on Shabbos. And what did it all count for? Nothing. That's why she Hashem has to forgive her. That means the irony is that there are people who do things thinking this is what Hashem would want. Never bothering to ask, does Hashem want this? And they think when they come up to Shemaim, they're going to get tremendous reward because look how, how from and religious I was. I even did things Hashem never asked me to do, I did. And you get a shock when Hashem says to you, since I never asked you, and you do things that you're not asked to do, you know, you want a reward for that? You want a pat on the back for that? There's no reward for that. As a matter of fact, that might be an Aveira. That means it's more important to do what the Torah says. Hashem is not looking for you to change the Torah and improve the Torah or modify the Torah. You know, Hashem is looking to you to do what, just to do what the Torah says. So that becomes more important than anything else. Okay. Let's go a little bit further. Good evening. We're, we're jumping around over here. In this week's Parsha, good evening. In this week's Parsha, we have two and a half Shvatim. The tribe of Ruvain, the tribe of God, and then we'll see later on the half the tribe of Menashe. What did they ask for? What did they want? So they wanted to live on this side of the Jordan River. Why did they want to live on this side of the Jordan River? What was the reason for the request? If we look in this week's Pasha, what was the reason? In the world. What? World. No. The they, land. They, they wanted to stay. They came to Moshe, Ruven God, and Chatzis Sheva Menashe, and they said, Moshe, we'd like to stay on this side of the Jordan River. What was the reason the Torah gives? They had good land for what? For the, they said, we have a lot of sheep. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of cows, we have a lot of cattle, we have a lot of sheep. Our animals need grass. This side of the Jordan has beautiful grass. The other side, you know, I don't know if it's in Israel. Maybe there's grass, maybe there's not. So we want to stay on this side. Okay? So really, only two Shvatim asked for it. Reuven and God. Yeah. Menashe didn't ask. Menashe is not part of the request. If you look at the, if the Pasuk, it just says Reuven and God. Moshe asked Menashe if they'd be willing, half of them, to stay on this side of the Jordan River. Why? Why? To keep the other two Shvatim safe. To keep them Torahic. To keep them following mitzvahs. That means Moshe asked half of God as a favor. Reuven and God could get lost in their sheep and cattle. You'll be in charge of the yeshivas, the spiritual side. And Moshe had a cheshman. Menashe was from Yosef. Yosef was the bochor from Rochel. 
Yosef got the double portion because Reuven lost his double portion. So this way, Menashe got two pieces of land, one on this side and one on that side. So Moshe was fulfilling what he felt was the halachic rules that the firstborn gets a double portion. But Menashe never asked. Menashe didn't come to Moshe, we have a lot of cattle. Okay. After the, the ask, every single time it talks about Reuven and God, who does it talk about first? Do they put God and Reuven or is it Reuven and God? God and Reuven. God, God, God and Reuven. That means even though Reuven is the older Shevet, and he was Yaakov's firstborn, in the beginning it says Reuven and God came to Moshe. After that, Pasuk, every time after that, it's God and Reuven, God and Reuven, God and Reuven. Why? Why? Because when Moshe began to question them, he realized only Reuven wanted the land for the cattle, not God. Why did God want the land on this side of the Jordan River? It wasn't because of cattle. Yes, they had a lot of cattle, but that wasn't the reason. What was their real reason? The Torah doesn't say. You know where we get the real reason? What? At the end of the Torah, in Vizos HaBracha. Mm -hmm. Moshe says, Ula God Omar, to my beloved Shevet God, Boruch Machi God, I give you a bracha that you should spread and be successful as much as possible. You know why? Vayar Reishi Slam. You came to me asking, we want the land on this side, we want the land on this side. But I figured out the real reason. Kishom chelkas mechokhek safun. Because your Rebbe, meaning me, is going to be buried in your portion. Mm -hmm. And you wanted the land where Moshe was buried. So nice. That was, that was it. That's what Moshe writes. When Moshe gives a bracha to God, he says, I thought it was all about money. I thought it was a business deal. It was pure business. But when I checked, you know what I found out? That had nothing to do with it. You researched where I was going to be buried, Har Nevo. And then you said, we want that land. We want Moshe's burial spot to be in Har Nacho. And that's why we wanted it. Now, when Moshe realized this, Moshe said, I gave a gift. Aaron gave the clouds. Miriam gave the water. What was Moshe's gift to the Jewish people? Torah. The man. The man. When Moshe describes the man, he says, Kizera Gadhu. It's like the seed of God. He uses God's name, God, the Shevet, to describe the man, the gift. So Moshe says, I'm going to reward you. When everybody eats the man, they're going to think of you. Shevet God. Why? Because Shevet God had this tremendous love for Moshe Rabbeinu. Now, Moshe taught them priorities. We talked about this. When they came to Moshe, and Moshe said to them, what, what are you talking about? You're going to be here. Your, your brothers are going to cross the Jordan. You're not going to fight for them. You're not going to protect them. This is what happened by the spies. He really gets angry at them. They said, no, 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 no. We will fight for them. As a matter of fact, we're going to build barns for the cattle, cities for our children, and we're going to go across the Jordan. We're going to fight all seven years. They actually stayed 14 years. They fought seven years, and they stayed for all the dividing. When they said this to Moshe, Moshe says, okay, I see I have to educate you. You said to me, you're going to take care of the cattle, and then your children. Let's reverse it. Who do you take care of first? Children. The children. First, you're going to build <coughs> cities for the children. Then you're going to build barns and pens for the cattle. So Moshe taught them what we call priorities. They put the cattle first, and Moshe says, put the children first. Okay? So it's a lesson, it's a lesson of priorities. Remember I told you the story of a teacher who gave an assignment, asking the kids, if you could be anything you wanted to be in the world, what would it be? So one kid said a spaceship. 
so I could fly to the moon and to Mars. Another kid said, I want to be an eagle so I could fly high and, and go wherever I want. And another kid said, I want to be a cell phone. I want to be a smartphone. So the teacher says, you want to be a smartphone? Why? Maybe my mother will give me as much attention as she gives her smartphone. <laughs> she says, my mother's always on her phone. If I'm a phone, my mother will be always, you know, talking to me and, and listening to me and playing with me. She says, my mother ignores me. I don't exist. So I wish I was a smartphone. So that tells you about priorities. I once told you this. This is, this is when Steven Spielberg put together this film called Shoah. Shoah was he interviewed Holocaust survivors about what happened in the Holocaust. So he was interviewing this lady, a lady in her 60s or 70s, and he said, he, I guess the person interviewing her asked her, what, what was your, your memory of Europe in those days? What was your, your favorite memory? What was your memory? So she says, you know what my best memory of Europe was? When the Nazis came and grabbed me and took me off to the concentration camp. So the guy said, you know, I'm talking about your happiest memory, not, not your most scary memory. She says, no, that was my happiest memory. I was happiest when the Nazis took me to the concentration camp. So he thought she had lost her mind. You know, what do you mean you were happy? How could that make you happy? He says, when I was growing up, my mother loved my sister. My sister was perfect. My sister was beautiful. My sister was great. My mother never spoke about me. I thought my mother hated me. But when the Nazis came and took me, my mother started screaming, don't take her, don't take her, that's my daughter, I love her, I love her, don't take her. It's the first time I heard my mother say she loved me. That's my happiest memory. That's a pretty scary story. You know, that's a, that story is way out there. You know, that's, that's one of those stories that's way out there. Because, believe it or not, you know, we grow up with our children, and we don't often say that they, maybe when they're five, we say we love you. We say it more to our grandchildren, but we don't say it to our children as they get older. I mean, we, we lose that connection. We, we just don't say it, you know, it just doesn't come up. But uh, this lady, you know, she grew up with this, uh, this feeling that her mother didn't love her. Her mother loved her less than her sister. So, you know, it became a, a frightening memory. So that, that's a really scary thing. Okay. Parshas Matos Masse always falls out in the three weeks between the 17th day of Tammuz and Tisha B'Av. What is a little bit of the connection between them? So, it's interesting. There are Rishonim, the Rosh. There's a famous Rishon called the Rosh. In the back of the Gemorahs, you have the Rosh. Then you have the Tosos HaRosh, you have a bunch of other things. The Rosh brings out a Gemorah on Baba Basra. Famous, listen to this Gomorrah and Baba Basra. The Gomorrah and Baba Basra says that after the Beis Hamidosh was destroyed, the people of that time took a nether. We swear we'll never eat meat again. Now, we don't keep that nether. All year round we eat meat. But we keep it for the nine days. We don't eat meat. Why? The Rosh says, they said, since there's no more meat, carbonate being brought to the base on Midosh, therefore we will no longer eat meat. This is a Gemara. Then someone else got up and said, in the base on Midosh, they used to pour wine over the carbonate. We don't more wine to pour. Therefore, we'll no longer drink wine. And that's why the nine days, we don't eat meat, we don't drink wine. Then the Gemara says that someone says, flour. There was korba mincha. No more korba mincha. We'll not have any cake or bread. No more flour. Remember, we said before, I don't know about fish. They didn't say anything about fish. But... Uh, the Chachamim said, no, that's going too far. Uh, meat, I can see where you give up. Wine, I can see where you give up. Okay. But bread, I mean, bread's a steak, we're going to give up. How are you going to be able to do that? Then, then you know, there's, there's another opinion that says, no, 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 no. 
We don't drink wine because we mourn the loss of the Besamidash, the Avelut. And then the Gemara says, no, that can't be the reason. Because they used to drink wine in the Beit Avel. When people came, the Gemara says, when you came to a mourner's house for Shiva, they used to drink wine. And that's why when you raise wine, you always say, L'chaim. Because where did you drink the wine? In a house where someone that just died. So you're saying, L'chaim, we should all live long. You know, just like when we leave a house of Shiva, we say, you should have no more pain or suffering. You know, Hashem should give you only bracha. You know, L'chaim, we should have life. So the Gemara says, no, it can't be because of Avelut, because in the house of Shiva, we drink wine. You know when they stopped drinking wine in the house of Shiva? When people got drunk. When he came to the house of Shiva, and the poor Avel, who was supposed to be mourning the loss of his father and mother, was drunk, because everybody was drinking wine. Okay, we do differently. You know, as far as they, you have a big thing to put food out and, and make a bracha. Ashkenazim do the same thing. They put food out. They're not into making the bracha as much. As far as they are, because you want to do a mitzvah, you want to do for the neshama. But, you know, it, it talks about the fact that a mourner, you know, a person, for example, sitting shiva, are they allowed to eat meat? The answer is yes. An owning cannot, because he has to prepare for the funeral. But once the funeral is over, you're allowed to have meat. So the Gemara says, it can't be that we don't eat meat or drink wine because of avelut, because, God forbid, a person loses their father or mother, they're allowed to drink wine, they're allowed to eat meat. So it had to be a different reason. It had to be because of the Beit HaMikdash, there's no more carbonate and there's no more wine being brought. If they would have kept going, they used to bring water on Sukkot. Imagine they said, no more water. You know, Maybe we could still drink Coca-Cola, because that would be a real tragedy. But, uh, you know, but it's interesting that many of the customs that we have come from different sources. Now, Rebbe, Rabbi Yehuda, Nazi, said something amazing. He writes in the Gemara, that a year where Tisha B'Av falls out on Shabbat and everybody pushes it off to Motsoi Shabbat Sunday, he says, if I have my way, Rebbe says, I would cancel Tisha B'Av that year. Wow. Now that's, that's, he would cancel it. He says, Tisha B'Av is on Shabbat. Can we fast on Shabbat? No. So we'll do it with Motsoi Shabbat. Rebbe says, no, nah, Motsoi Shabbat, Sunday. I cancel it. Sunday, Sunday. no, I cancel it. That's what Rebbe said. <laughs> The Gemara didn't agree with him. The Chachamim disagreed. Why did Rebbe believe he would cancel it? Very interesting. Rebbe believed that Mashiach would be born on Tisha B'Av. So in Rebbe's mind, if Tisha B'Av was Shabbat, Sunday there's a Mashiach somewhere in the world. So what are we fasting for? That was his attitude. He believed, you know, that there's someone there that's, that could announce himself as the Mashiach. So he said, why am I fasting? I should be preparing for the Simcha. You know, and it's interesting. The emotional, you know, here comes Tisha B'Av, and people are, are all upset, and, and you're crying, it's Sunday. The next Shabbos is called Shabbat yeah. Nachamu. Tu B'Av, Nachamu. All of a sudden, Tu B'Av is one of the happiest days of the year. Like, it's five days after Tisha B'Av. You know, it is the happiest day of the year. Singing, dancing, party, Shabbos, Nachamu. You go to shul, there's a kiddush everywhere. You know, it's, it's really, it's a, what we call this an emotional roller coaster. One day you're down, one day you're up, you know, you, you, can't, you can't follow that. But that's how we are. We, we do not allow ourselves to be depressed. We don't allow ourselves to go around as if we, we were broken. Just the opposite. You know, we, we're like the phoenix that rises from the ashes. So it, it's interesting, it's interesting how how we react to different things in different ways. My brother-in-law tells a story, very interesting, listen to this. Uh, although he's, you know, the Chofetz Chaim Heritage Foundation puts out these CDs. You know, they put out, you know, programs, and they have one this year. He's not on it this year. Uh, he just was so busy, I guess he couldn't get involved. But about five, three or four years ago, he had taped a whole Tisha B'Av talk. And they prepared all the CDs, a thousand CDs, to send all over the world. Like a week or two before Tisha B'Av, he gets a phone call, he has to retape the whole CD. Why? This is fascinating. 
they taped the CD in May. And, you know, they put up a podium, and it was the Tisha B'Av program. It was in May time. During, it was even before Shavuot. And I guess he, he had a dry mouth. So he had a glass of water, so he took a glass of water like that. When they played it, they said, you know, we're going to show this on Tisha B'Av. Everybody's going to be seeing Rabbi Kron at Tisha B'Av. In the middle of the speech, he takes a glass of water and he drinks it. You know, you don't think of it. You know, he, 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 this is it. the boy's supposed to write on the bottom. Please note, Rabbi Kron drank this water in May. You know, it does. So they, they had to throw away all the CDs and they started all over. They had a whole new CD. Like, you don't even think of it. You know, so people, you know, give speeches. You ever have, you know, I don't, I, I tend not to. But you, you see speakers, speakers all the time, they're taking water. So he didn't think twice, he took a water, but he didn't realize he was doing a Tisha B'Av program. So, you know, sometimes it, it comes out of left field. You don't even think of these things, <laughs> you know, how things happen. Okay, uh, we asked the question, listen to the question. The question we asked is, is making a nadir a good thing or not? Let me explain to you what it is. Let's say a person needs to lose weight. My doctors tell me if I lost 30 or 40 pounds, I'd walk better, my knees would hurt less. Are they right? 100%. There's no question there. Does that mean I, I'm going to give up ice cream and cake? No. No. That means it's human nature. I know that's my Yetzirah. I know what it's telling me. But, you know, I told you before, the Yetzirah is going to get you one way or the other. Let it be cake. Let, let that be my mistakes in life. Okay. Let that be it. So what happens if a person says, okay, i got to go on a diet. I'm going to make a nether. I forbid all cake. All cake is like chazer. So I'm doing what I think is a good thing. Is it a good thing? So the Gemara debates it. And the Gemara says that if you make a nader, it's like you built a bama. What's a bama? A bama is an altar, a mizbeach. But you know where it is? You're supposed to bring all your korbanot to Yerushalayim. But there was a period of time people didn't go to Yerushalayim. They built a little mizbeach in their backyard. And it's against the Torah. And it's a horrible thing because it stopped people from going to Yerushalayim. So the Gemara says, if you make a nether, it's like you built this bumba in your backyard. And if you keep the nether, it's as if you took an animal, slaughtered it, and sacrificed it on the bumba. <laughs> Which is like doing the worst avera imaginable. So, oh, it, it's crazy. And the answer is, because Hashem doesn't want you doing things out of the ordinary. You know, do what, what people do. You know, I had, I, I once told you this, I had a guy, he came, he sat on my front steps of my house with his computer because he wanted to use my Wi-Fi. Okay. So I said to him, you know, it's winter time even, it was the winter time, and he's sitting there with his coat over his head on my front steps with his computer because he wanted access to my Wi-Fi. Okay, some rain must be coming. Look at that. Caution. Wi-Fi. Wow. Wi Amber alert. Amber alert. Okay. We all got it. Okay. Huh? Normally I can't get internet in here, but that I got. Okay. So, so I said to the fellow, I said to the fellow, I don't have a problem with using my Wi-Fi. How he had the password. He asked me once, I guess, for it, or he, he tried or whatever. Aww. So I said to him, I said to him, why don't you come inside the house mm -hmm. and sit in the kitchen or sit in the living room and, and use the Wi-Fi? <laughs> Next time you want to ask the drink right? and then eat. You know, whatever, but the, I, I offered him that. <laughs> and there was a reason why. Because, I mean, and he doesn't understand this. I tried to explain it to him. I said to him, I get complaints from people. People come to the house by me. And a lot of times, the people come to the house, um, people come to the house, you know, are very private things. Yeah. And they don't want to see a stranger on the front porch who sees them. They'd like to be able to know they can come in privacy. So I, I say to him that, you know, people are uncomfortable 
because you're sitting on the front porch. He couldn't understand that. So I tried a different approach. I said to him, here in Kew Gardens, look around, let's look on the block, on the porches. How many people are sitting outside the porch with Wi-Fi? <laughs> nobody! I says, doesn't it seem strange if it's such a normal thing, why nobody does it? Doesn't that tell you something? If nobody else does it, this is the norm, and this is you. What does that tell you about you? <laughs> it tells you something's wrong, right? It tells you something's wrong. Uh, he, 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 he was not happy. Send them in the library. I tried that up, and people come to the back. Eventually, he did. I made suggestions. <laughs> then, a few weeks later, I'm walking to show. I go Hashkama. It's, uh, it's, I'm walking like 6 30, 20 to 7. He's out on a, a, where he had a little apartment. He had on a porch with this talus over his head. Davening to Hashem in a loud voice, 6.30 in the morning. Mm -hmm. I'm walking by, and it's going like this. He says, I, he says, now what's the problem? I'm davening to Hashem, 6.30 in the morning. I said, no problem. But I'm looking up and down the block. How many other people are on their porch <laughs> at 6.30 in the morning? <laughs> I mean, nobody! Don't you understand? There's, there's normative behavior. And when you don't do what everybody else is doing, you know... Did he just come to America? <laughs> no, it, just, it was just so strange. Couldn't get it. Ramosha Feinstein... Ramosha Feinstein... Healthy guy? What? Listen to me. Healthy guy? After the moment. Ramosha Feinstein was once asked a question. Someone said to Ramosha as follows. He says, when I go to show, I can't doubt. The guy next to me is talking, the guy, you know, they're talking about the sports, they're talking about the rabbi. He says, I can't, though. You know, I have no kavana. If I stay home, in my living room, where it's peaceful and quiet, mm -hmm. I can dive in with a hundred percent kavana. Do I have permission to stay home? For Shabbos morning to stay home. And Ramosha said, no. No, yeah. No. But he says, I, I, my davening shul is a waste of time. He says, so, waste your time. Let it be. Let it be waste of time. There's 90% of the people, shoes What? There's 90% of the shoes not being taught. Correct. So Ramosha said, I, I know that, that. We have to fix that problem. That's the problem. But you, you should be in shul. Shabbat morning, you belong in shul. That's where you belong. Do you don't belong at home. Even though your kavana at home will be much greater. What about giving the week? No, he didn't. He wouldn't let him. People do whatever they do, and I'm not here to, to talk about that. But Ramosha, his response was, "No, why not? Because he wanted people to do what was normal, it was normative, and we learned that out for the whole thing of the uh, of Nidorim. You know, we do Nidorim; it has to be normative. Listen to this. Very interesting. In the Ultra Palos Hatorah." Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, Rashbi, right? Your phone, they really like you. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, okay? You ready? His name is found in the Gemara, I think, 2,000 times. Something like that, the Rashbi. So it brings down that in the entire Mesechet Nidorim, there is no halacha quoted in the name of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. And when asked why not, it says, even though Rabbi Yonasan ben Amsoi and Rabbi Yehuda ben Gerim lomdu mesechen nedarim bebeit medrashe Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, he says he would refuse, he would refuse to say any halachot when it came to nedarim, because he believed that a person should never, ever make a nether. And therefore, as much as his name is mentioned thousands of times, almost every other page in every Masechta comes to Masechta Nedarim, boom. No, his name is not there. It says, Shirabi Shimon ben Yochai Hechmir Kol Kach Nedarim. 
He wouldn't, he wouldn't allow Nedarim even to make peace between a woman and her husband. He would never, never, never allow anything to happen. And he, he believed it was so important to avoid making Nedarim that his name is not mentioned at all. Okay. In Pasha's Matos and Masa, they led a battle against Midjon, Right? Everybody asks, what about Moab? Moab were the bad guys, but they didn't touch Moab because of Rus coming from Moab. And in that battle, Bilam was killed. Subsequent to Bilam being killed, whose life was going to come to an end? Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe. Because everything in life is a balance. The Goyim had Bilam, we had Moshe. They lost Bilam, we lost Moshe. Everything is a balance. The Ocha Pelosa Torah asked the question, how old was Bilam when he died? A lot of different interesting 25. opinions. One opinion says that Bilam was 33 years old. Oh my goodness, Yeah. Now, if that's true, he could not have been one of Paro's advisors. Yeah. There's a Gemara that says he's <coughs> Paro's advisors. Yeah. To be Probably Paro's advisor, they were in the desert for 40 years already. Mm -hmm. So he was born when the Jews were in the desert. So he could never have been Paro's advisor. So he was loving. Right. We're going to see that in a moment. So it says over here that one opinion is that he was 33. And there's an opinion that says someone saw his matseva, his tombstone, and it says Bilam ben Boor killed at age 33. Someone says it's written on the matseva. Don't know. Haven't seen it yet. Another opinion based on the Gemara says that Bilam was 210 years old. Mm -hmm. And that Bilam was one of Paro's advisors, and it was his suggestion to Paro to throw all the Jewish kids into the Nile. So if that's the case, Moshe was 120, and Moshe was born in Paro's house, and Bilam was already an advisor there, so they estimate that he was 210 years old. Um, some people say Bilam was Lavon. If he was Lavon, then, and that's Rabbi Yehuda Chosid says that, he was much, much older. Much older. Uh, doesn't yeah. say how much, but must have been hundreds of years old. Because Lavon was in the days of Yaakov. Yeah. The Zohar says that Bilam's father, Baor, was Lavon. Bilam was the son of Lavan. Oh, wow. That means he says, Kodesh Isa Arami Hoya Aviv Avi Bilam. So no, Lavan was his grandfather, I'm sorry. So Bilam was the grandson of Lavan, and Reb Chaim Vital in his Sefer Hagil Gulim says the same thing. So oh. There's, in that case, he was much younger. You know, he was back to being 33 years old. So there's different opinions as to how old uh, he was. And nobody knows exactly, but some people, here's 35 years old, that he was cut out, he was cut in half of his life. So there's different opinions Maybe. as to how old he was. Maybe they have Bilam Jr., Jr., Jr. According to the Tzadis <laughs> 210, how old he was? Yeah, it was just interesting. There's a famous Gemara with Rabbi Akiva. Listen to this famous Gemara. Rabbi Akiva, when he grew up, what kind of a Talmud Chacham was he as he was growing up? He hated him. He hated Talmud Chacham. He would bite them. If he, would, he, he, he couldn't learn anything. Then he met this girl. It's always about a girl. The girl's name was Rachel. Who was Rachel's father? Kabla Savua, a very rich man. When Rachel told her father, I'm going to marry Rabbi Akiva, her father says, you marry him, I make a nether, I'll never give you a penny. You will be penniless, you will be broke, and she married him anyway, and he wouldn't give her any money. And she used to wake up in the morning and pull straw out of her hair from her mattress, the straw that she slept on in the barn. She slept, they lived in a barn, Rabbi Akiva. Eventually, Rabbi Akiva became the great Rabbi Akiva. 
Kabul Sobua heard a big time of Chacham was coming to town, went out to greet him, and when he asked who is this guy, he told him it was Akiva, and he realized this was the Akiva who married his daughter. And they asked him, how is he living? He says he lives, he's broke, he's poor, he has no money. Kabul Sabu was a wealthy man. So he wanted to give him money. But he couldn't because he made a nader. Couldn't break it. So he couldn't break it. Yeah, so the Gemara goes through a whole bunch of different people till finally someone was mater nether. And who was the person who was mater nether for him? Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva asked him, had you known your wife's husband would be a big Talmud Chacham, would you have made the nether? He said, no. It was a mistake. From the beginning, it was a mistake. So Rabbi Akiva says, it's an obvious mistake. Because when you go to yeshiva, as long as you're serious, you'll become a Talmud Chacham. Yeah. So you should have anticipated that. And therefore, he, he was matter the nether. So it goes to tell you how far. The Baal HaTurim, listen to this. The Baal HaTurim says, the word nidarim is the same gematria, the number value, as rotzeach, murderer. The Baal HaTurim, it says, because a person who makes these promises, promises and doesn't keep him, is a murderer. Because the Gemara says, Hashem exacts judgment against your family. So, the Durham is a Rotzeach. When they went to fight Midian, 12,000 soldiers went there. There's actually 36,000. 12,000 fought. 12,000 stayed behind in the camp to guard the camp. 12,000 died. Every Shevet sent 1,000. Which Shevet did not send 1,000? Levi. Levi. Everybody agree with him? They sent that one. Did Levi send? Not officially the one. They wanted to know. Did Levi send a thousand people? Yes. Yehuda. Yehuda. Yehuda for sure sent. Levi sent because Pinchas led them. So if Levi sent a thousand, which Shavit did not send a thousand men to fight Midian? You have eleven more guesses. Actually, you have twelve because you have a Friday and Manasha. Come on, if I give you to choose between three, three Shvatim, choose three more names, see if you get it right. Yehuda, we're not counting anymore. Mm -hmm. Levi sent. Who did it send? Shimon. Shimon, give that lady a gold star. <laughs> <laughs> because Shimon was the shaver that got caught up in the trap, right? They mm -hmm. lost 24,000 soldiers. Mm -hmm. So Moshe says, I don't trust Shimon going back uh. to Midian. You know? If you get caught up in Midian, you're not the guys who go back there. <laughs> he, Moshe didn't trust Shimon. But Levi also was with him, though. Not here. That was in Shechem. You're talking about when they were kids. We're talking about when they killed Bilam and they went to fight. How did they kill Bilam? With a sword. Interesting. Uh, yeah. The, 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 it was the whole thing. Pinchas used the right. four in the Shemaim. That's what they say. Pinchas was, you know, uh, if you were right. What? It, what happened to him? To, to who? Shimon. Shimon were the ones who got caught up in the whole affair of Cosby Batsur. They came into Moshe, can I marry her? They, they, it was their shaver that did all the sinning. So Moshe was not going to send them back. So Pinchas started the redemption. So Moshe said Pinchas. Once he said Pinchas, Shevet Levi wanted to go as well. So they went. So then, the ones that stayed behind were Shevet Shimon. Okay, I once told you the story years ago. I'm going to end with the story. Listen to this story. It talks about the borders of Israel and everything else. I even went through all the borders of Israel, but I won't even go through that. There is, there was, a famous rabbi in Germany, Hanover, Germany, back in probably the 1800s, maybe the 1700s, I don't remember, his name was Reb Nosson Adler. Sfardi. Right? He was a Sfardi? Became Sfardi. Became Sfardi. Reb Nosson Adler was the Rebbe of the Chassam Sofer. So he was one of the leading rabbis of world Jewry in Hanover, Germany. One day, Sir Moshe Montefiore, the famous, you know, he was a very wealthy man, he was a financial advisor to the British government, 
came to visit him in Hanover, and Rabbi Adern saw that he was very troubled. He looked very pained. And Rabbi Adler said to him, what seems to be the problem? You look very much in pain. He says, I just came from Queen Victoria, who's visiting Germany, and she's pregnant. And she's going into her seventh month, and she's having contractions. If the child she has will be born on German soil, then that child will not allow to be king of England. Yeah. He'll be considered a German citizen and not eligible for the crown. And this is causing the queen tremendous agony. So Rabbi Adler said to Moshe Montefiore, how did the queen get here? So she came by, by a German uh, boat, by, not by, by an English war boat, by an, by an English uh, boat. So he said, quickly, take the queen, put her back on the boat, and sail to the 200 mile mark. Then, if she has the child, the Ark Royale was the name of the boat, that child will be born in international waters on a British boat. Yes. Then the child is a British citizen and can become king. Yes. That night, so they says, he quickly went back to the court of Queen Victoria, rushed to the famous British warship, the Ark Royale. That night, she gave birth to a son, who later became King Edward VII of England. <clears throat> a few years later, there was a request from the Jewish community to appoint a chief rabbi in England. The name being suggested was Rav Shamshel Rafal Hirsch, very famous, and other great rabbis. When they, no when they notified the queen that they were looking for to appoint a Jewish rabbi to be the chief rabbi of the entire British Empire, the queen said, there's only one rabbi I will accept, Rabbi Nosson Adler, because he's the rabbi who, who gave me advice, and I know he's a good man. And they offered him the job. He became, it passed parliament by a vote, and he became the chief rabbi of the British Empire, a post he filled with honor and distinction for 45 years. <clears throat> okay? <laughs> it's, just, it's just interesting, somehow, how these little things in history, you know, how the Rabbotim were there to service the whole world. You know, forget about all the anti-Semitism and everything else. Must have been Queen Victoria for sure is in the 1800s, maybe even the 1700s. You know, she was a well-known queen, Queen Victoria. There were not many queens. You know, there were mostly kings. Uh, queen Elizabeth. Look at Queen Elizabeth. She's in her 90s. I mean, she's one of the longest reigning queens. In our day, now it's uh, Queen Diana. Yes. There was Princess Diana. Princess Diana, whatever. But she's no longer here. Still Queen oh, yeah. Elizabeth. Queen we have Queen Elizabeth. And then will come Prince Charles, and then will come his children, whatever yeah. said. But that's an interesting story. Rabbi Adler became the chief rabbi. And Queen Victoria was the one who was the chief rabbi. Um, well, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs was, and now he just finished his term. I forgot who the chief rabbi I don't think it's Rabbi Sachs anymore. Well, in England. In England. Oh, the chief rabbi, I forgot his name. Yeah, yeah it's no longer. He said, he said he's not the. He was only one who on uh, Rabbi Yosem Mizrahi from England. Yeah, I don't know who it is. He was only, he, he banned him. Yeah. Right, there was Lord Jacob, which was very, very yeah, good. Yeah, they they banned the, him from England the, for coming. The, Something the, happened to the Chief Rabbi. Listen, I, I don't even know who the Chief Rabbi in New York is these days, this week. <laughs> Forget about the, the England. All my know. London friends. Three three London, yeah, there. there's three, right? Okay. So... As they say, there's a, too many chiefs, not enough Indians. Yeah. <laughs> That's what the old saying was. You got the more Indians. <laughs> not easy. Not easy mm -hmm. discussions. Mm -hmm. Have a good night, everybody. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Next week, I think we're on. Even though it's the day after Tisha we should be on. Mm -hmm. Sunday night, sure, I don't have.